Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. I'm going to read just one verse of Scripture from Acts, chapter 2, and verse number 40. You realize this is after the Holy Ghost has fallen on the hundred and about 120 in the upper room, and Peter standing up rather than slinking away, and um, the and uh, following what must we do? Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. I'm not going to do that tonight. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all the listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourself from this crooked generation. We'll talk to you about the bottom line. The bottom line. I leaned over to my granddaughter, and I said, if the Lord came back right now, would you be a little girl over in heaven? So the real question was, well, would I be an old man over in heaven? Isn't it interesting? Out of all of the preaching, he turns around and looks at them and says, save yourself from this crooked generation. I thought he was our Savior. Well, let me put it to you this way. Can you choose not to be saved? So if you can choose not to be saved, you can also choose to be saved. So he's not trying to infer that we do not need a Savior. But he's also saying it is really critical what your choice is going to be as the pressure is on as the circumstances, as the confusion reigns, as all the things that happen in this world. What's interesting here is that the same man who had the keys to the kingdom that Jesus said he would have made this statement that is possible for us to save ourselves from this crooked generation. God has never told us to do something that we can't do. The bottom line the bottom line. By the way, you can't say one other person, your children, your wife, your husband, your mother-in-law, your whatever. You can't save anybody else. He didn't save save the world because Jesus is a Savior. But he said, he said it's going to be critical that one understand that the responsibility lies with the individual. The only thing standing between you and eternity in heaven is you. If you put somebody else in that position between you and God, you put them there. God did not. People have effect upon people. But the bottom line is, save yourself. Save yourself. I would think you would be encouraged. As much confidence as I have in a whole lot of people, family, church family, I really don't want you standing between God and me, eternity and me. And what Jesus did at Calvary is he purchased back for us that is no longer the prophet, no longer Moses, no longer someone else. It's Jesus and me. I want you to feel good when you go home tonight because you know it's in your hands and he hasn't left us alone. He is not inferring that we do not need him as the Savior. But he's also putting us in the position that if you're listening to the wrong preacher, it's your problem. If you're married to the wrong person, it's not somebody else's problem. It's your problem. And you can save yourself. 
No matter what circumstance that you face, whether face whether it's health. By the way, the Lord saw you running tonight, not walking. I saw you running, and the Lord saw you running. I said to myself, I wonder if Keith's having a problem in the ride. No, he ain't. he's running around the church. I, I'm not just digressing here. When you know what you want to do and you can't do it, do something. Do something. Save yourself. Save yourself. Now, the things I'm going to bring to you are not all inclusive, but they are important in this saving ourselves from this untoward generation. When you read about the signs, you know, the disciples wanted to know when's the Lord coming back and when is kingdom coming in. And then the Lord said, it's not for you to know when I'm coming back. And then he gave them some signs. As much as I don't like earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes, as much as I don't like wars and rumors of wars, the thing that Jesus said and which has caused more confusion in this world is false Christ. Now, who would be, if I stood up here and said, I want you to know that I'm going to reveal myself to you tonight. I'm Jesus. I've come back, and I'm Jesus. There isn't a person in this place, even though you love me. You'll probably get concerned for my wife that she's leaving, you know, living with somebody that's off his rocker. and that. But you're not going to believe somebody saying they're Jesus. But if you're not careful, you might believe someone who is purporting to preach Jesus and is not giving you the word. Because you are to save yourself from this crooked generation that is perverse. God has also empowered you that you can do it. And Satan is trying to come forth with false Christ saying, well, this really isn't necessary even though it's in the Word. It's important to hide the Word of God in your heart, not just so you can Bible quiz. So that you can save yourself from the false Christ of this world. Even if one would show up in this pulpit. This congregation has been formed upon, and if you look at that old logo with the banner across there, the Word and the Spirit connected by faith. The Word of God you can know the Word. God will give you the Word. False Christ. He said they're going to be false Christ. Everybody points their finger at God and says, why are they putting up with all this confusion? Why is God putting up with all this confusion? Because people are making choices. Do you really want God to step in and destroy these false Christ prematurely? When He does, He's taking away your choice. But we have to know. Slick talking. And they're not just in Washington, D.C. or some other capital of the world. Hopefully ignorant of the word. But how you're going to save yourself from this crooked generation is be founded on the Word of God. Your life. Parents, you are responsible for your children, but they grow up. Hopefully, you put some things in their heart and discipline and all the things, the authority that God has given you, but they grow up. Now, Vince, the world says you got four more years and then you're an adult. Think your mom and dad will say, well, maybe eight or nine. <laughs> Whatever. There's increased responsibilities. False Christ. And who's going to save you? Is the preacher going to save you from false Christ? No, you're going to save yourself. Who are you listening to? 
Who are you listening to? Because someone has a nugget of truth doesn't know, does not say they don't have some poison in their tongue. And there's no one that can say they know the book like God wrote it. But I can tell you, because the book says that there's salvation in no other name. No other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And everyone knows what that name is that I'm talking to. His name's Jesus. That's word. When you take baptism out of the salvation plan, you've just removed not only his name, but his blood. When it isn't necessary, but just a symbol of faith. And that's just one example. False Christ. And whose responsibility is it to find out who you're going to listen to? Save yourself. Save yourself. Now, we are all called as Christians to be witness for Jesus Christ. But it is interesting that he takes our weaknesses to make the greatest demonstration of his power. It was already mentioned tonight about his strength becoming perfect and our weakness. But his witness becomes perfect in our, in, in our witness, our weakness in ourself. Because how could someone who is so weak have such faith? Because it is not just a test of faith, but it's also a test of salvation. Is there a circumstance too big for God? No. Is there a circumstance too big for us? He's saying not so in Him. And in fact, it says He will not put on us anything that's too heavy to bear. I can't imagine being in a log, Isaac, in a log. And the uh, saw is cutting the log, and I know it's coming to cut my middle section. What Holy Ghost power those folks had. <laughs> Same Holy Ghost we've got. Nothing that he says he won't be in the midst of it. Why didn't he strike the, the king dead and elevate Daniel or one of the Hebrew children as ruler over all of Babylon? No, he just walked in the fire with them. I'm talking about the bottom line. The bottom line is you can save yourself because of him. But you must make that choice. And the biggest battle is promises that aren't based upon the Word of God. You don't hear very much anymore about prosperity. The reason, if you'd heard the message this morning from a prosperity standpoint... It would have been this. You want to tithe and give offerings because then you can get rich. The very nature of the thing that would destroy us, greed. (laughs) There were a lot of folks bought into that. I'm tired of being poor. I'm going to be prosperous. And so I'm going to bribe God. And yet the Lord counteracts greed by giving. Not giving out of necessity. Not giving grudgingly, not giving out of the because there was pressure. You give willingly, chief, cheerfully. Counteracts greed. When you're thinking about Jesus, it's hard to think about things. And so it is to save ourselves, we have to realize that when in the latter days, Jesus said there would be false Christ, and we're experiencing them. Well, preacher, how about you make a list of all the uh, false Christs in the community? No, you make the list. I have. Not going to listen to them. Not going to fellowship with them. I'll minister to them. I'm not going to cut them off. When you resist, you see their false message. They'll cut you off. You know when you came to the Lord and all your drinking buddies, they cut you off, didn't they? Did you cut them off? You just didn't go drinking with them. And they cut you off. At least mine did. 
had a couple of them because I was a bachelor at that time. They still were kind to me, invited me over for a good meal once a week. <laughs> False Christ, save yourself from this untoward generation. The bottom line is save yourself. That is not self-centeredness. That's wisdom. The Spirit of God, Jesus said, is expedient to go away because I'm going to send him back. I'm going to come back. I'm coming back in spirit, so I'm not limited by any flesh, and I can be with and in all of you. I can be throughout the world, 7 billion people, 6 to 7 billion people. Don't overwhelm me. I can be with every, And we all have our story about how the Spirit of the Lord touched our life. Don't we? And it's precious to us. Don't forget that story. Because this is the nature of the world. The nature of the world is not what I have done for you. But what are you doing for me now? The now generation demands. Demands their way. The Spirit is not only the comforter, but the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. How with so many ideas, so many philosophies, so, many, so much intelligence on a human level that when compared to God, it doesn't match up, but compared to one, by, among one another, very convincing. How can we know truth? He promised us by the Spirit of truth that it would lead us into all truth. We need the Spirit. The Spirit is under attack because it is by false Christ saying it's just for some of us, special people. And we're all special people. We need the Spirit. I shared with a few folks this morning about what had happened as I figured that I was right. I was living with and married to my senior in spiritual age, 13 years. And we had had a disagreement, and I was sure I was right. A preacher I'd never seen before, got to know later on that I'd never seen before, he'd never seen me. I went to church, and he straightened it out. I was wrong. I wanted to go there, and I was right and be able to poke my wife and say, huh, see there? But here's what happened. I realized, you see, when the Word of God gets personal, you're either going to be offended or convicted. Conviction brings change and blessing. Offense brings rejection. And you're saving yourself when you realize that God, so personal, will bring the Word of God right in the midst of what your need is, even when you don't know what it is. Because that night, I realized going home that God cares so much about me that He gave me a message and straightened me out about something that was trivial, and I hadn't even asked Him. And from that time on, I go to church, God, God, I need to be saved I need to be saved, God. You have been faithful for 40 some years of keeping me straight by your word and spirit. Your spirit, I ask you, God. I don't need to be confirmed. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And so that spirit of truth, you can count on it. The Holy Ghost in you is a spirit of truth. And it's warring against the opposite spirits in this world, but it's also warring against our spirit. David's prayer was, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Are you praying? Create a clean heart in me, O God. And renew a right spirit. You see, iniquity is the sin of the spirit. Satan just does not want to corrupt our soul. He wants to corrupt our spirit so that that spirit, that iniquity, keeps us separated from the spirit of truth. And so the spirit of God has been given to us that we can save ourselves. 
Without his spirit, we would be confused. We would be deceived. We would be delusional without his spirit. Because evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. And so, you save yourself by engaging his spirit. There isn't anything in this world, and I, I, I had enjoying times in human endeavor in a number of activities uh, within my life. But you know what happened to those activities? I either grow, old, I either grow, grew, grew older, and didn't participate in them. I'm talking about decent things and accomplishments and things. But one thing about everything that was accomplished in this world, it just grew old and didn't have the same significance. Not in the Lord. It's as if it's the first time when I feel His Spirit now touching me. And He's touching you. It needs to be fresh and vibrant. It is not some gimmick. It's not learning some new language. It's entertaining His Spirit because He's the Spirit of truth and He wants to empower you to save yourself. You cannot give it to somebody else. Because if you could, you could take it away. Isn't it good news? The God that gave it to us is not going to leave us or forsake us. I'm talking about saving yourself in these perilous times. I do not like what Jesus said. To say that I don't like what God said. Many called and few chosen. I don't like that. I used to pray as a pastor, if they can't be chosen, let it be some other place. <laughs> I can't stand it, Lord. If I'm preaching to and I'm thinking... That person's not going to make of that. You're not going to make it. And then I finally realized I'm supposed to judge him in the, in the first place. And so, but he emphatically said, if you are moved by who is and who isn't, you're on shaky ground. Don't be impressed by the standards of the world. Don't be impressed. If someone else becomes your, your source of truth rather than Jesus. And we've come to support one another and be kind to one another and so on. But the spirit of truth has come not to lead us into falseness. But in the writings, it says we can grieve that spirit. I don't want to grieve you, Jesus. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me, God. When my attitude gets out of shape, I'm not going to blame you. Maybe for a few seconds. Maybe a few minutes. Maybe a few days. But eventually, it's going to come back where it needs a roost. It's me, O oh Lord, it's me. My heart is fixed, O oh Lord, my heart is fixed. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. I'm talking about the bottom line. The bottom line isn't how you're functioning in the church, whether you're a big toe or an earlobe or the heart it, or the brain. You're really not the brain because he's ahead. It isn't. The bottom line is save yourself. All of us develop our relationship with God, and mine is. Anytime I get under pressure, I say to the Lord, count me in. I don't need to understand, but count me in. Not quitting. Not knuckling. It would crush me. And it does as a pastor to see one of my brothers or sisters walk on Jesus. But I'm not quitting. Count me in. Because if I feel that bad, how bad is Jesus feeling? Count me in. The spirit of truth. We can't brag about it. We can just embrace it. Be thankful for it. See, it's foolishness to the world. 
It's the spirit of life to us. It's a life-giving spirit. Because truth prevails. That's why he wrote, buy the truth and sell it not. That's why David said, my heart, he, he, he did some, as you know, some stuff that brought consequences to himself and his family. But the man wouldn't let go. He would not let go. Would not let go. My heart is fixed, O oh Lord. Pray the prayer. Don't give up. Don't be in this so long that you're not praying. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. No matter how bad somebody treats you, don't realize, don't, don't, in the Lord what can happen. Don't let it corrupt your heart. Don't it, don't, don't it cause in your spirit, the spirit of contention in this world. And your choices, he never fails. Because somebody's wrong doesn't make you right to deal with them unkindly. Third thing, this isn't all inclusive, but I know it works. By the way, miracles don't, don't convince anybody. Pastor brought us, you know, the principle of that beating greed this morning. And absolutely, 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 you see. But miracles don't move people. I've watched folks have, I mean, an individual new in the Lord came to me and said, without teaching, but had read in the Bible. I see that God wants me to give tithes and offerings, but I'm in such a bad shape in back debt and things. What I, what I need to do is I need to keep a record of what it is, of what it, I owe. And when I get settled, when I get it figured out, then I'm going to start paying it back to the Lord. And I just said out of the blue, why don't you give God a chance and for the next two weeks, tithe. Put it to the test. Received a check unanticipated, not anticipated in any fashion. Received the check that wiped out all the debt. And that man's not serving God tonight, as far as I know. If he was here, I wouldn't be doing this. And you, hey, we've only had five to 7,000 people come through these doors. And so if you can figure out who that man, I, I did let you know it was a man. Miracles don't do it. In the same service, Ethel and Jean Swartz. Ethel Steich and Gene Swartz in a service of about 15 people with missionaries. They both were miraculously healed of cancer and lived long lives. Ethel served God. Gene never got baptized. And I was teaching her to Bible study. Miracles don't do it because you've got to save your own self. And I, these signs follow believers. They don't precede them. And I believe in miracles. Every time you see Tom Volpe, you got to imagine him about three feet shorter than that with braces on his legs and walking with uh, metal canes. Not a six foot two or three guy standing so straight and God miraculously healed him. I told him, I'll never forget it, Tom. I wasn't there. It was my brother-in-law where he was pastoring. And that there are people that witness Tom Volpe and his young people. You here that are grown up, you saw him when he was crippled. And if you decide to walk on God, that miracle won't even move you. But if you decide... I'm going to serve Jesus. 
Count me in, Lord, however you talk to him. Heaven and hell can't take you away from me. Nothing in this world, humanity or circumstances, can not take you away from him. If you made up your mind, I'm going to save myself. But trust in the Lord. Short sermon tonight. One verse, short sermon. <laughs> Going against my tradition. <laughs> if I give two words, people will know they're in for two hours. <laughs> you know what we need to be towards one another? We need to be kind. Now, there's some teenagers going to listen to me now because what they're going to say to their parents when they're putting squeeze on them is give me space because the preacher said so. I didn't say that. <laughs> we need to give people the opportunity to save themselves. And people have problems. That's why there's a church. In my pastoral ministry, many, many times, and I'm not going to say all the time, people came to me for one or two reasons. One is they wanted me to straighten out somebody else in their life. Or they want me to take full responsibility for the mess they were in. Now, I didn't tell them to go home and grow up. Or grow up and go home. <laughs> want to be kind to one another. We really do. Really do. You don't know what's going on in the heart and life of a person. It really makes a difference. You're not being like the world where they have an ulterior motive of what they want to get from you. So they spin whatever they are and act in a hypocritical way. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having the, having the kindness of Christ in your heart towards one another. You know why there's a fence within the church? Because Christians become offended. Isn't that a wonderful definition? <laughs> they take it personal. That's why Jesus said if somebody comes up and smacks you on the cheek, turn the other one. Don't take it personal. Say, he just hit me. I'm glad he only said twice. <laughs> he did say to forgive seven times for every offense every day. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> you don't know. You do not know. You don't know what they're going through. I'm not talking about condoning uh, improper behavior. You don't know. I know. What am I talking about? Saving yourself. Saving yourself. I am. This is critical. How you treat other people. It's critical. It's not your performance that's going to impress God. It's your heart towards the person who is also in his creation, in his image. Because they're one of his too. And they have to save themselves. 
through Jesus Christ. But give them space. Give them space. One of the most effective witnesses to someone is when they apparently won and you were Christian. Won when they shouldn't have won, whatever it was. Because we're living in a world that's really hurting. Before coming to the Lord, I saw sadness in people's eyes that should have been glad. Knowing how to hold a cigarette properly and hold a mixed drink and look like you know what you're doing in a country club setting was the saddest place in my life. Because I got to see into people's souls that they were so ha- uh, they were so sad. God will draw them, but you can only save yourself. Seven days in a boat that nothing's happened. Seven, eight people. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness for how long you've been preaching, Stan, since 96 or something like that. 17 years. 17 years. Noah preached for 100 years. He didn't get a convert except his family. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> ooh. Okay, God, I've had enough of this. These people, these people, they're perverse, they're crooked, nobody's listening. Keep building the boat. Hey, God, you're not listening to me. Nobody's responding. You know what boat you're building? Your life. Keep building the boat. Be kind to people. Their vim, their vengeance, their wrath. My response when somebody's tailgating me and I'm going the speed limit is to slow down real slow, let them pass me, and then run my car into them. <laughs> now, I'm just telling you what I had. If they knew the old me, they wouldn't mess with me. Just because I got white hair doesn't mean I'm going slow, jerk. (laughs) It's the truth. I go to AARP, 55 in the live classes. That's, you know, driving enhancement things so I can hang out with people that are older than me. (laughs) Man, there's one lady with a walker. I'm praying, oh, God, don't let her drive anymore, please. She could hardly get into the session. <laughs> no, don't let her drive anymore, Lord. <laughs> and you will not be prepared when you think I should not have my license anymore. You will can you can't be structured enough to get prepared for that. <laughs> Cause I'm gonna be driving all right. <laughs> When I'm 99. (laughs) Giving people. Giving people space when they irritate the. You're saving yourself when you do that. Young people when you're living. you're, you're, You're dressing modestly. And you're trying to conduct yourself right. And they're hassling you about it. It's not about you. It's about your God. And you have an opportunity to stand up and not curse them or spit in their face or something which you like to do. Hey, you know, girls didn't fist fight in my day. Hey, D, holy smoly. If I, 
I think of some about those Amazons that I went to school with. I would never end the fight with those girls. Hey, it's craziness. But they're human being. They're human being. They're human being. And when you treat them right, you're saving yourself. It isn't because of our works. It's because what you're doing is you're having a heart of Christ. Do you realize just three days before his crucifixion? I think it was three. Whatever time it was, his trial. Maybe it was shorter than that. Doesn't matter. They're hollering because they think David's come back. They think Israel's going to be uplifted instead of being destroyed by Rome. Triumph, even though he's on a little donkey and they're spreading palm leaves and things. And they turned on him. And his disciples rejected him because they were so afraid. And he could have taken himself down because they couldn't take his life. He gave it for me and for you. You're not sure the miracle is going to take place. And I got story upon story upon story, which I'm not going to. I could make a four-hour sermon. They could never be saved. What happened though in the midst of it? In the midst of it. You're saving yourself. Because you're not getting all wrapped up in you. So we're not hypocrites. We do really care. When I show up at a family gathering down in Texas, with the exception of Jack and Janet and Samantha, and I'm not sure about Mike Andrews. He's in the church, but he doesn't know me very well. There's trepidation in the heart because they know the preacher's coming to town and he's after them because he wants them and saved. He wants them saved. <laughs> no, that's true. I got Jonas in my family. That's right, running from God. And so I'll sit there and talk like a normal human being. Because <laughs> you know why? I'm going to save myself, and God's going to get them. God's going to get them. They might ask the right question, I might be involved. Or somebody else might, but God's going to get them. They're going to have a chance. They're going to have a chance. Putting people ahead of self. Even your enemies. Now, I want you to know, I did not grow up. Neither that preacher back there. We did not grow up. Loving our enemies. <laughs> they knew. They knew. I wasn't as big as him. And I don't know if even I had as much energy in him, but I had plenty of it. I didn't love my enemies. I took care of them. <laughs> That's my nature. Melvin, I'm just being honest tonight. Buddy, and <laughs> hey, my nature is not to love my enemies. In fact, my nature isn't even to love my friends sometimes. That's a nature in me. But oh, I want to be saved. The bottom line they accused Jesus, you saved others, but you couldn't save yourself. They might point the finger, but you can. Save yourself from this crooked generation, perverse, untoward generation. Because there's people in that generation that you'll be able to touch by your kind heart. The Spirit of Christ within you.
I've even got under conviction when the guy passes me on the right and I'm parked next to him at the next light. And I'm going, ha, ha, ha. No, I, I even under conviction about that. <laughs> kind to people because they're God's creation. I'm talking about saving yourself. You can't hold a fence. It isn't just between a brother or a sister. If you let that spirit of offense, and that's a whole sermon in itself, if you let that spirit of offense take over you, not only will you be shielded from the word of God because you'll become offended at it, but you'll, de you'll develop a spirit that is worse than the spirit you were saved from and be surprised at what's happening to you. And the way you counteract that, being kind to people. Being kind to people. And it's the best way to live. The best way to live. Amen. And so save yourself from this untoward generation. Jesus is coming back. There are false Christs out there. The Spirit of God is still at work, and He's keeping us, and you need Him. Not just to feel good. You need Him. You need that truth when you're dealing with circumstances. Don't respond in your flesh. You need that Spirit of God talking to you. Remove yourself to your prayer room and interact with the Spirit of God. What would you have me do? What would you have me do, Lord? And be kind to people. Be kind to people. And I know you're doing these things. I'm encouraging you that are doing them. Keep on. Don't get discouraged. Because God's in the saving business, but you can't save anybody but yourself. But in the process, you become an instrument for him in helping save other people. Let's stand to worship the Lord. Now, if you think you can replace what I just said to you by some function in the church. God help you. That's not our value. And I'm not telling everybody to quit where they're volunteering doing something for God. Do it for the Lord. That is not where it's at. It's not where it's at. Not where it's at. It isn't. Got a text message which you mentioned about he was 16 years old. The lady he is married to now was 14, and they were in my teen class. We were in the literal upper room where they probably had to break down that desk because I don't know how they got up there in the first place. But we had our upper room, and that's where Stephen's mother, because I said that's where she learned how to minister to teenagers. And he learned how to lay on that desk and drink his bottle and be quiet. I got a text message saying, Merry Christmas. How's the pencil pusher doing? I knew it had to be one of two people. And I made the telephone call and found out. And it was Tim. Tim was 16 years old. He's now a grandfather. Last time I saw him, he said, how do you like joining my generation? <laughs> I thought I was in heaven among those people because they actually appeared that they really liked. They didn't like me. They just, I was part of them. They didn't care where I was working, what I was doing, the tormenting and all the kind of stuff. I mentioned to Brian the other day, they had me trying to put up crown molding when they knew I didn't even know well. <laughs> if you don't, if anybody wants you to put up crown molding and you haven't done too much carpentry, they play in a joke on you. They're waiting to laugh at you when you put the two pieces up there and they don't fit. <laughs> it's a three-dimensional cut. I know that. <laughs> and I got a card. A card I usually get on Father's Day too. Her name's Tilly Bruce. She was raised by her great-grandmother, her grandmother at least. Tilly's one of my girls.
She's an African-American young lady that has been living for God from the time of her teenage years. A preacher's kid and a kid that really didn't have a chance. They're both serving God. And I had an opportunity to be a little bit a part of their life. When you look back, that's what you want to look at. A Christmas card from a young lady who has forgiven you for leaving her in Kaiser, West Virginia, and coming to the East Coast. Because she is one of the teenagers that I had to tell that we were leaving when we had to wake in my living room. That's where it's really at, being kind to people. Being kind to people. And I can look back and I can tell you, it's been a major instrumental part of the life. Because it wasn't about me, it was about them. And I've reaped some benefits from it in relationships that are going to bring us to heaven together, even though we've been separated. Oh, I encourage you tonight, God wants you. He's no respecter of person. Be kind to people, and you'll find out you'll have a word. You, every, every part of the body ministers to itself. It does. And what you'll find out is when you're putting people first, your ministry in the body will just make room for itself. Because the corporate America plan for the church does not work. Because we're not about making money. And the Holy Spirit of truth, and you've got to realize that Jesus said there are going to be false Christ. And what you need to do is pray for them, too, that God can even save them and they be converted. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful life we've been given in the midst of horrendous, chaotic, critical pressure times. And we have this opportunity now to decide, are we going to live for him? Are we going to live for him? And it comes down to a personal decision. My wife and I had two covenants. One was I was going to take care of her, even if it was poultry. I, in other words, I was going to take care of her financially. And that was just one of our covenants. The other one was if either one of us walked, they walked out not just on Jesus, but us. I'm not telling you you have to do that. But we have that covenant, and it is a bond between us. I do not serve Jesus because of my wife, but it's a great deal of comfort to know that she has that same kind of bond with me. Amen. Amen. Save yourself. Aren't you glad that God gave you that command? It is a privilege with a responsibility that is horrendous, but he backs it up. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. No matter where you're coming from, you can make it. But you have to make that choice. And it's your responsibility, not the preacher, not your husband or wife, not your children, not anybody else. It's yours and his. And you can make it. And he's an awesome God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We praise you, wonderful Savior. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Be the source of love in a world that is so self-centered about itself. Be a source of love for other people. Thank you, wonderful Savior. We worship you. We magnify you, Lord. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. On this Sunday night, how about if we, and this isn't a gimmick, what I'm saying, but it would be nice that we walk together. Let's join together up in front. Don't kneel. You don't have to. You're already submitted. But that we have a bond of peace and of joy and hope and love for one another as we go about the Father's business in 2013. And God will not let you down if you put others ahead of yourself. He will not. He will bless you mightily because that's where his heart is. Come on, let's come forward and stand together. Let's stand together. Amen. Let's stand together. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, wonderful Savior. Hallelujah, wonderful Savior. We worship you. We worship you. Oh, hallelujah, worship you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Every one of us are complete in Him, but thank God for the body. Thank God for the family of God. Thank God for one another. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we worship You. We magnify You, Lord Jesus. 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 Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We worship You. We praise You, Lord. We praise You, Lord. We praise You, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. We worship You. We worship you. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we praise you and honor you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. Thank you for one another, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, Lord, and worship you and praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we worship you, we worship you. We worship you, Lord, we worship you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're facing challenges, which we are in this coming year, some needing jobs, some needing healed marriages, some needing all sorts of healing for the body, circumstances, I want you to know, save yourself. He'll take care of you. He will. He'll take care of you. Have faith in God. He'll take care of you. And stay connected to the body. We can't save each other, but sure glad to have a family of God that cares about one another. Not perfect in any stretch of the imagination, but the love here is. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For two or three years of my first, I felt the fear that this was going to fold up. I'm talking not here. I'm talking about when I came to the Lord, that it was going to fold up and I'd be left desolate alone again. 
I got good news for you. Got good news for you. 43 years later, he had even folded up. And it's real. It's real. Nobody can force you to do it, but also nobody can force you not to. He's put it in your hands. And what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. It's a song, but it's true. Hallelujah. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. God, as we close this service, thank you, Lord, for this family. Thank you, Lord, for this family. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the family of God throughout the world. And, oh, God, our heart beats like yours, Lord. Give us souls lest we die. Yes, Lord Jesus, touch the lost, Lord, nothing impossible with you. But above all else, as the song says, I must be saved. Yes, Jesus. Thank you for purchasing that at Calvary. And God, thank you for the fellowship of believers, Lord. Oh, thank you for your presence, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for this peace, Lord. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful Savior. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Isn't it wonderful? I don't have to make the announcement. Don't drink too much. <laughs> My should say, don't eat too much. <laughs> Is it, you know, where we, you know, you know. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. The days when the day of the Lord, 2013 is going to be the year of the Lord, too. Amen. I'm not saying he's coming back, but he's going to be here with us. God bless you. Amen.